Howdy, I'm Jeffrey Snover. I'm a technical fellow at Microsoft and I'm the lead architect of the Enterprise Cloud Group. The Enterprise Cloud Group is the group that brings you products like Windows Server, System Center, Operations Management, and something I've spent a lot of time on recently and that's Azure Stack. So I want to start, first start by talking about the evolution of Windows Server because I think it provides a nice framework and context for thinking about really a dramatic change in the industry. In starting with Windows NT, Microsoft took you know, Dave Cutler's awesome kernel, we combined it with PC economics and put a desktop GUI interface on top of it and transformed the world. Prior to this, servers were the domain of the high priests and princes of the technology world. But with Windows Server 2000, or sorry, with Windows NT, now Microsoft provided a server for the masses. Anyone could buy, deploy, and operate their own server, and we transformed the world. There were so many of these, it brought about the next era of server and that's the era of enterprise server. Now with the first era, you walked up to a machine and you managed it locally. You literally walked up to the server, had a mouse and a keyboard, gave it a hug and managed it. With the enterprise server, we added Active Directory and group policy and we could tie all the servers and the clients together into a coherent experience. And the way you manage that was with remote desktop. Essentially, a local remote desktop experience, but projected to a remote client. With Windows Server 2003, we brought about .NET. And with .NET, that brought about the line of business application explosion. There were so many people that could now write their own line of business applications that we needed to produce the data center era. With data center server, with 2008 and, 2000 and tw Windows Server 2012, we could now scale up massively, we could scale out, we improved our uh, hyper, we introduced virtualization to, into Windows Server, and we started to improve our, our storage stack. And here, you change the way you manage things. It was a fundamental shift. At these scales and these importance, you could no longer do things remotely with a GUI. And so we brought about the era of managing things in Windows through automation, in particular through PowerShell. Now these are the technologies that, Windows, that, Azure, that Microsoft used to build Windows Azure. And now we're taking that and we're bringing the, last, or the latest era, and that is the cloud server. Taking the tools and the technologies and the learnings from our cloud and making them available in Windows Server 2016. And the point about this is that Windows Server 2016, these eras are not replacing one another, they're adding. A whole bunch of people will use Windows Server 2016 in a server for the masses mode or an enterprise mode or a data center mode, but now there's a new scenario enabled the cloud scenario. So I thought I'd step back for a second and kind of explain the thinking. I'm a big fan of why. When I tell you what, you know what happened. But when I tell you why, it acts as a generator function. It helps you understand why we did what we did and helps predict, allows you to predict what we'll do in the future. So one of the whys was as we looked at, talked to our customers, we saw this tension arising. Businesses need uh, and demand new applications. What we're seeing is that those businesses that are able to listen to their customers quickly, respond to those customers with features, and deploy them quickly, and then iterate, are getting transformation, they're transforming their business, and they're getting such a competitive advantage, they're just doing that over and over again. However, this really conflicts with the core IT values, right? As IT, we've grown up trying to provide stability and predictability, and therefore there's a clash between these two. Often this clash gets resolved by something called shadow IT, where the line of business people will go bypass IT and go directly and use the public cloud, and that just creates a mess that IT has to then go clean up afterwards. So we wanted to help address that. The key point is that the cloud is not a place, it's a model. The cloud is not a place, it's a model. And what people really want is they want their choice of that model in lots of different places. They want to be able to take advantage of that model in a public cloud or take advantage of it with a service provider 
or to be able to run it on their own businesses. And they want the right to be wrong, right? They want to be the right to be wrong, which is to say if they go and deploy it on an on-premise data center, and then they realize, geez, you know, that's really more expensive than I thought. It doesn't give the elasticity I want. I'd like to move it to a service provider or to a public cloud. They want to be able to do so in a no-drama way. If they deployed something in the public cloud and decided, yeah, that's better off on-premises, they want to be able to bring it back without any drama. And so that's what we're building. We're building this hybrid cloud platform. On the right here, you see Windows Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, that has a full global scale infrastructure. We have more regions and data centers than anybody by almost a factor of two, and we continue to grow them you know, year after year. Just amazing amount of investment in global data centers. This is important because when you deploy your application, one of the key factors in customer satisfaction is the latency you can deliver your application to them with. So you want your application running as close to your customers as possible. And if you want to be global, you need a global scale infrastructure. On top of that infrastructure, we run infrastructure service and PaaS services. We have an application model, a cloud application model with something called the Azure Resource Manager. And on top of that, we have GUIs, portals, PowerShell, and, a, and we enable the DevOps tool chain. Now, what we're doing with Azure Stack is we're taking that and making it available on premises, in your data centers, or in hosted service providers. We have a cloud-inspired infrastructure. It is not the same as the Azure infrastructure. Azure infrastructure starts its scale-out units at a couple thousand servers. When I talked to customers and said, hey, would you like to start with a couple thousand servers? Not too many people are interested in that. Azure Stack starts at a four-node configuration. So, but the design of Azure Stack is inspired. It has the same design principles as Azure. On top of that, we're taking the core set of IaaS and PaaS capabilities, not all of Azure, but the core subset, the core subset that allows applications to be built and run across different places. And then we have exactly the same Azure Resource Manager, exactly the same GUI, exactly the same set of commandlets, exactly the same set of tools. And what this does is it enables an ecosystem where you can build applications or developers can build applications and allow it to be used by customers anywhere, public cloud, hosted cloud, or private cloud. It allows customers the maximal um, access to applications, um, and it provides one ecosystem for everybody. Windows Server is the foundation of all of this. Windows Server runs the on-premises on data centers. It is also the basis for Microsoft Azure, and now what we're doing is we're taking the lessons of Microsoft Azure incorporating them into Windows Server 2016 and making that available on-premises as the Microsoft Azure Stack. So again, what are we trying to do here? And the answer is we want to be cloud competitive. I mean, Windows Server, awesome server, but when we looked at the cloud, we realized that some really big changes were required to remain competitive in this new era. We needed to be small and fast, we needed to minimize the attack surfaces, the patches, the reboots, and we wanted to be optimized for a DevOps workflow. Windows Server now has a new installation option. We have a full GUI. This is optimized for small business scenarios and for remote desktop. Uh, you get the full GUI administration tool there. We have server core. This is to run traditional uh, server headless applications in your data center. Uh, and we now have nano server. Nano server is a new headless deployment option. It is optimized for two scenarios to begin with. We're optimized for cloud fabric, the thing that's gonna run on the host and provide virtualization and storage. And we're optimized for next generation application host. Okay, uh, in the future, all of Windows Server will be refactored and will be optional components on top of Nano Server. But to start off, those are the two scenarios. Windows Server 2016 introduces containers. 
Okay, you're all very familiar with containers, I'm sure. Uh, you have your traditional stack of hardware, the operating system, and the application. Traditional virtualization virtualizes the hardware. Containers virtualize the operating system, okay? Now, we're, we're a little different than Linux in that we have two deployment options for containers. The first type of deployment option is what we call Windows Server containers. These are isomorphic to the Linux containers, right? Traditional container virtualization, uh, OS virtualization. But we have another type of deployment option, and that's called Hyper-V containers. Hyper-V containers takes the container and runs it in essentially a, a stronger isolation, a stronger security layer. So we have a product called Azure Automation. With Azure Automation, I will take your PowerShell scripts and I will run them in the cloud. You manage your cloud assets or your on-premise assets. But I'm doing that for everyone in the world, right? So when we want to run those in containers, I can't run your code and your code in a traditional container. There's not enough strong isolation. Hyper-V containers give us, us the confidence to be able to run, say, the KGB's containers and the DNC containers all on the same host. Right? Nice high level of abstraction and security. In order to work with Nano, uh, we needed to refactor PowerShell. Okay, PowerShell is .NET based. It uses the full .NET library, and the full .NET library is not available on Nano Server. Only .NET Core is. Eff effectively, what's happened here is .NET is doing the same thing Windows Server is doing. They are dramatically refactoring, starting off small and making things that allow you can install things through optional components. We had to then refactor PowerShell to work on that. So this is PowerShell version five, major investments in desired state configuration, huge investment there. Security, uh, just amazing level of security in PowerShell version five. We now have the PowerShell gallery where you can take your scripts and modules and resources and publish them and find the community's uh, uh, versions that you can start off and use. We have Pester. Pester is a unit test framework and is the basis of something we call operational validation tests, where you can test the validity of the operations of the system. And we have Visual Studio Code support. Now we've taken PowerShell and refactored it to run on this new core version of, Power, of .NET. And it has full language compatibility and it has full remoting. Okay. Now the individual commandlets themselves need to be able to work with .NET Core. Many are there, many still need to be refactored so that they support that, okay? So we're starting off, but it'll take time to mature. We announced open SSH support, finally, okay? Yay, is that awesome? So with open SSH support, I want to be clear about what we're doing, right? This is not some arms length integration. We're taking open SSH client and server, and we'll be shipping them in Windows client and server. However, it goes far beyond that. We are now taking open SSH and we're integrating it into the heart of PowerShell. PowerShell remoting protocol can support multiple transport layers. We support WinRM by default. We also support something called PowerShell Direct, which allows you to do a, a PowerShell connection over the VM bus to talk from the host into a guest. We're also adding OpenSSH support to PowerShell remoting. PowerShell is now open sourced on GitHub and it's available to you with an MIT license. That's right, an MIT license. You can do basically anything you want for this. You can take a copy, change it around, sell it if you want. MIT license, fantastic stuff. And an alpha version of this is now available on Mac OS and Linux. So if you haven't tried that, I encourage you to. It's truly amazing. So I mentioned to you that we needed to be cloud competitive. That was one of our motivating thoughts, right? We want to be small and fast, minimize the services, you know, attack footprint, the patching, the reboots, and to be optimized for DevOps. So let's see how we did. 
Okay, here we show the security improvements. The number of drivers loaded, we're showing it nano server versus server core. We go from about 100 to about a little more than 73. Okay, so almost 25% reduction in the drivers loaded by default. Services running, 47 down to 20, 28, big reduction there. The ports open, we go from 30 ports open by default down to 12, almost one third the number of ports open. In terms of resource utilization, the process count by default goes from 26 to 21, about 20% increase, decrease. Uh, the number of IOs, the amount of megabytes required to boot the OS, goes from 300 megabytes down to 108. So if you ever had a virtualization or a, a VM, you know, reboot the physical server and you gotta bring up all those VMs, they will now come up much faster because they consume so fewer IOs. The limiting factor is always the IOs. And the kernel memory in use goes from 140 down to 61. So that means more memory available to you and your applications or means higher VM density. But here's where it really gets exciting. And that's in the deployment improvements. Look at these numbers. The setup time goes from 300 down to some unknown number. I think, <laughs> seems like the old copy of the slides. Uh, that's a very low number. I can't remember exactly what. <laughs> the disk footprint uh, goes from five, anyway, the v virtualization size. Server with a GUI is about nine to 10 gigabyte VHD. Server core is about six gigabytes of VHD. Nano server, 480 megabytes, 480 megabytes. Windows Server in 480 megabytes, just amazing. This thing boots up like the, as fast as the wind. You put it in a, a Gen 2 VM running on an SSD, Windows Server can reboot in 2.5 seconds. Phenomenal stuff. So I mentioned to you this notion of eras. And what I'm here to say is that, hey, Windows Server 2016, awesome server. It's awesome if you want to have a small business and run it on a single machine. It's awesome if you're an enterprise. It's awesome if you run in a data center. But it really does set us up for this cloud transformation. And that's the thing I really want to highlight, is the cloud is a transformation. It's a transformational environment. And I will tell you that if you think about the people who are running your company today, the CIO, the CEO, the CTO, all the vice presidents, all the directors, all the managers, I will tell you that in 10 years, most of those people are gonna be gone. Probably, it's more like five years, most of those people are gonna be gone. And they are gonna be replaced by people who've been able to figure out how to harness the power of the cloud to transform their business. Now the point is, many of the people to replace them, the candidates for that are here in this room. So I want you to take a second and look around you. Take a look at the people next to you, look at the people in front of you. These are the people who might be leading your company in three to five, six, seven years. But I want you to stop and ask yourself the question, why not me? Could I do that? Could I be the one that is able to take and harness the power of the cloud to transform my business and emerge a leader? I will tell you that I know uh, in the tech industry, uh, there's a lot of imposter complex, that we all have this you know, fear of you know, confidence and you know, crisis of confidence. That well, no, probably, maybe the guy next to me, but not me. And I will tell you that as somebody who every day, I go up to the, the door of the, the building and I use my key card, and every time that light turns green, I'm always amazed, right? I have the imposter complex to an incredible degree. And yet, when I was working at Microsoft and we were fully embraced in the enterprise era, I saw that a transformation was coming for the data center and that we needed a new way to manage things, a data center-oriented way through automation. And I drove that change. It was hard, it's very painful, but I drove that change, and I emerged from that a leader of the company. I mentioned to you that I'm a technical fellow. Let me help get that in focus. Microsoft has over 100,000 employees. There are only eight individual technical contributors that are technical fellows. It is the highest rank that we have. 
And so as somebody who's always surprised that the light turns green, you know, how in the heck did I get to do that from there to here? And the answer is that at the right time, I could see a big change coming, and I prepared and I led the company through that change and emerged a leader. And what I'm telling you is that cloud is that transformation, far larger than the other, far larger. So I want you to be the person that drives that change in your company. You can do it. The fact that you're here proves that you're on the right mindset. So go have a great time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. There's a number of things, you know, next steps to the, in the cloud journey. There's some great sessions, great sessions yesterday. You can look them up afterwards, and a bunch of great sessions today. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I would like to now introduce Peter St. Allen, lead engineer at Salesforce. Thank you. All right, thank you, Nigel. And thank you, Puppet, for inviting me to come speak. Uh, I am Peterson Allen. I'm the lead software engineer on the Puppet team at Salesforce. And we've been using Puppet since about 2012, when we first built our proof of concept for the new way that we were going to build and manage our hosts. And today, we now have 30,000 puppetized nodes that we're managing with Puppet. Salesforce has been a, a pioneer in cloud computing since 1999, when they were established. And we have data centers across the globe that are supporting billions of transactions a day. And customer success is Salesforce's number one priority, which then makes the success of that infrastructure, you know, my number one priority. Uh, we're using open source Puppet, and we have tens of thousands of puppetized hosts in production now. Uh, some of them are virtual, but most of them are running on physical hardware, which, you know, has its own set of challenges. We have our puppet masters in each data center, and all of our puppetized hosts call the agent out of cron. And we're regularly pushing out our Puppet releases as a single package out to our Puppet Masters. In our internal environments, that's on continuous deployment. So every time we get a new release, that build goes right out to the dev, uh, the dev machines. And in production, we're doing continuous delivery. So we've got uh, scheduled releases that we do about twice a day. Uh, last year, I gave a talk called uh, Testing and Production at Salesforce, where I go into a lot more detail about how we actually deploy. Uh, essentially, we're just using Puppet's directory environments to serve multiple releases on our Puppet Masters. And we use that so that whenever we push out a new release, only our Canary host in production will consume it right away. Everything else just keeps using the previous release until that Canary window expires. Uh, during this talk, I may make some forward-looking statements, but I cannot actually predict the future. So be sure to take anything I say with a grain of salt. All right, so when I first started at Salesforce, they'd already gone through a pretty significant culture change in software development, right? The, the teams were embracing Agile and Scrum. Uh, we had cross-discipline teams. Everything was going into source control. There was a solid test and deployment pipeline. And everyone was really getting involved in you know, iterative development. But a lot of those lessons had not really filtered down into the infrastructure teams. And I get it, infrastructure is hard. Right? There's a lot of steps that go into building a data center. Uh, physical hardware can be unpredictable. And you frequently need humans to shepherd you through the process. But back then, we had some really terrible feedback loops. Right? If so we were building the data center, and something got misconfigured early in the process, we might not notice until weeks later. And at that point, the team that made the mistake probably moved on to another build. So it was a lot of work just getting some of those mistakes remediated. 
So we put a lot of effort into validation steps and human remediation all throughout the, the steps. Um, we were managing our infrastructure using code, but it wasn't quite infrastructure as code. Uh, Salesforce was going through a bunch of rapid growth, and we were staying on top of it using an army of sysadmins running automation scripts. And although that was helping to keep us going, it was not going to be sustainable. Right? We had some pretty scary metrics that were making it clear that we were not going to be able to build enough capacity fast enough to meet demand, no matter how many bodies we threw at the problem. And we had to make a change quickly. One of the things I love about Salesforce is its ability to embrace culture change when we need it. Right? As soon as we discovered that this was going to be an issue, we did what a lot of you are doing right now. We went to DevOps conferences. We went to PuppetConf. We went to Velocity. We listened to Gene Kim's talk. And we all read the Phoenix Project. Uh, we got the pets versus cattle talk. And we even hosted our own internal DevOps conferences where we started mining ideas from engineers across the company. And we internalized a lot of really good ideas and really good lessons that are now a core part of Salesforce's culture and infrastructure. Right, I think one of the most important was declarative versus procedural. Just a few years ago, we were building all of our hosts uh, as a series of install steps. And we were keeping them patched and maintained using what was essentially SSH in a for loop. And you know, that has its own set of problems, right? We'd have huge variation on hosts, a lot of snowflakes, just based on the date something was built, or who built it, or what combination of patches had been successfully applied. Right? You'd have to solve a logic puzzle just to figure out what state a host is supposed to look like. But with a Puppet DSL, that gave us a chance to just define the end states for our roles. Right? The humans could do what they were good at, which is define what a role is supposed to look like. And we had a chance to let the machines do what they're good at, which is you know, make these hosts match that end state. And for us now, it doesn't matter what initial state a host is in. It could be a, a new host build. It could be a live host in production. But as soon as they successfully run the Puppet agent, that role is now a homogeneous member of our fleet. Right? And that eliminated a whole class of validation. Like, you don't need to have Nagios checks on file permissions you know, and have that notify a human. If Puppet sees something out of compliance, it's just going to fix it on the spot. Right? And uh, no humans had to get involved. And the declarative language did take us a long way, but it was not enough. Right? We really had to start treating this like any other software project. Uh, we had an infrastructure needed to start using the same disciplines that the other software teams were using. And that meant everything had to go into source control. Uh, we needed to have uh, automated testing on every change. And we needed to get a regular deployment cadence going. Right? We couldn't just make ad hoc changes any longer. And you absolutely can do test-driven development with, for infrastructure projects. At Salesforce, we make heavy use of VMs and our spec puppet and Vagrant and Rouster to do automated testing on every change that comes into our, our Puppet code base. Uh, one of those tools, Rouster, we open sourced back in 2013. Uh, it was written by my friend Connor. And he gave a talk about it at PuppetConf 2013 uh, when he first opened it. Uh, it is, uh, Rouster is a Ruby library that uh, lets you orchestrate Vagrant VMs directly inside of your tests and has a lot of helper files for executing Puppet and for confirming state. And we use that for all of our testing. We use that everywhere. Uh, it's great. All right, so scaling up for us needed to be a lot more than just automation. Right? Back uh, when we were building everything as a series of install steps, it, you had to solve a logic puzzle to analyze a role. Right? Not only could there be potentially hundreds of scripts you'd have to find and read through, 
but you needed some tribal knowledge of anything manual that might have happened to those hosts you know, across their lifetime, right? Which is a pretty big barrier to entry for new hires. Uh, once we started defining that into, uh, defining all these end states into a single code base, all of a sudden that became much easier for new hires. And I think it is critical that you optimize for the mean time to grok, right? How long is it gonna take a new hire to understand your architecture? You know, how quickly can they make a meaningful improvement to it? You know, how long is it gonna take you to describe your architecture to the NOC at 3 a.m.? Right, these are all things you need to plan for, and sometimes you have to make some pretty painful trade-offs to achieve that simplicity. Uh, but for us, it is definitely worth it when it comes to troubleshooting and for new employees. Because uh, there's a lot of turnover in the tech industry these days, and even if your employees are gonna stay with the same company, most of them are gonna wanna jump around to different projects. You have to make it easy for them to understand your architecture quickly, um, even if you have to make the trade-offs to get that done. All right, so some of our lessons we had to learn the hard way. When we were originally building our proof of concept and getting everything Puppet approved, we were planning to release into a Greenfield environment. Right, Greenfield is a pristine environment. You can build it right the first time. And we were, it's very ambitious. We had a lot of automation tools planned. Uh, and all of our roles were gonna be built by Puppet. And once we built this new data center, we would then convert everyone over and decommission the legacy data centers, right? But in hindsight, it turned out that waiting for this new data center to come online before we actually used Puppet was a big mistake, right? When that data center got delayed, we were code complete for quite a few roles, but nothing was using it, right? And we were making these drastic improvements to the way we could build and manage hosts but none of the legacy data centers could benefit from it. And uh, we were getting no real world data. We had no feedback loops. We had a continuous integration pipeline, but without actual data, we couldn't tune it at all. And without any real successes, there is this growing concern that maybe Puppet wasn't gonna be able to deliver everything we had been promising. Right? At this point, all we had to show for it were some demos. And I think we had missed a key DevOps lesson, which is just build your MVP, right? your minimum viable product, the absolute minimum that you can deploy and still call it useful. Get feedback and then iterate and improve it over time. Right? We hadn't done that. We were going for a big bang, 100% role conversion. And where we... Where we eventually found our first success was in the brownfield, right? In our legacy data centers that were serving our existing customers. Finally, a couple of engineers put through the idea of, let's just pick one role, a nice easy role, and let's puppetize every instance of that role in production. And let's start to point, and then let's see what happens. And it was easy to get that approved because these machines had to get re-imaged anyways. So overnight, we had hundreds of puppetized hosts running in production. And man, that was an instant success, right? We finally got this feedback loop started. We could figure out how we were gonna push out changes. Uh, we could figure out how to recover from mistakes, right? That's when we came up with the canary process that I talked about in my last talk, right? All of these huge improvements that we made they were completely impossible before we got that first feedback loop started. And it immediately created two classes of servers within our infrastructure. We had the puppetized hosts versus the non-puppetized hosts. And right after we had converted that first role, CERN reported a vulnerability that we had to get patched ASAP. For the non-puppetized hosts, that was a significant effort. Even just tracking which host had been patched was a massive task. For the puppetized hosts, we changed a single line of code. And within a few hours, all of those puppetized hosts were patched. And we had the guarantee that any future host 
that applies the puppet agent was guaranteed to have the patch, right? There's nothing additional we had to track. And this was our first big win, and this finally started selling everybody on the value of Puppet. Uh, and it's, it's the patching that really drives home uh, the power of defining end states, right? Uh, patch parties used to be a huge part of Salesforce's culture and infrastructure. We would have all hands on deck, engineers across the company applying patches to every host in the fleet be just hours and hours of engineering time. Uh, these days, thanks to Puppet, patching is so trivial that the last patch party we had was an actual party, <laughs> right? There was a lot more dancing and a lot less slaving away for the machines, right? I loved it. Um, after we got that first role converted, we decided to take a much smaller route and just set up a Puppet adoption pipeline where we would just go through one role after another, work with the role owners to define their roles in Puppet, and then convert every instance of that role, right? And we just did that one after another, and today, 95% uh, of our infrastructure has now been puppetized. Um, woo! <laughs> so when we first started doing uh, Puppet, it was useful to have everything going through a single team, right? It gave us a chance to design our architecture and to establish some patterns that everyone else could follow, right? But you wouldn't create a Python team and then funnel every script change through them, right? You would empower your engineers to write and own their own Python. And so don't, don't treat the Puppet DSL any differently, right? When, <laughs> When we, as we started getting more and more roles converted, we ran into a pretty big scaling problem with our team, right? We had all of these roles were now being defined in Puppet, and only the Puppet team owned the Puppet code, which meant the Puppet team effectively owned every role. And we were a small team, right? There's no way we can be the subject matter experts on everything. And we ended up uh, solving that using R10K and moving to a distributed ownership model, right? R10K is this fantastic tool that gives you a single file where you can describe all of your Puppet modules, which Git repos to download them from, and which specific version of that module to download, right? We get this one file that represents a snapshot of our Puppet code base, and we can use that for our automated testing and to package up the artifacts that we release into production, right? It made it very useful because we could have that snapshot, but the modules themselves could be fully owned by other teams. They can iterate, they can do changes, they don't have to involve our team at all. Just whenever they want to release that change into production, they just have to send us a pull request to update the, the version number for their module. And that kicks off a whole round of automated testing that will eventually merge their change into the code base and then get it into uh, you know, the next deployment into production. And man, I love the Puppet community. Back before we had solved our distributed ownership problem, we were hosting a Puppet meetup at Salesforce's headquarters in San Francisco. And somebody gave us this great talk on R10K and explained to us how this was gonna solve the exact uh, scaling problem we were having on our team. And we were able to hash out a decent solution with everybody at that meetup. And within a couple days, we had a proof of concept built. And by the next week, we, had, uh, we were able to start handing out ownership of these modules to teams across the company. Right? It solved a massive problem for us thanks to that meetup. And we've been coming to uh, PuppetConf since 2012. And every year I'm consistently impressed with the elegant solutions I see people coming up with, and we steal from the show all the time. Um, there's lots of great ideas. Uh, a lot of your problems may feel unique, but I guarantee you that you're gonna find somebody here at this conference that's already fought almost that exact same battle. Right, you just, just, just need to listen.
All right, so once we had started turning infrastructure into code, we had another really nice benefit, right? When we defined the end states for all of our uh, roles, all of a sudden our architecture became much more portable, right? If we can now define that end state on anything that we want to call a node, that could be VMs, containers, public or private clouds, simulated data centers, test environments, uh, cell signaling, autonomous self-healing compute layers, right? With Puppet, we now have access to architectures that were completely impossible to us before. And so I'm really excited to see where else Puppet can take us as we architect out the next generation of our data centers. All right, thank you so much, uh, Puppet, for letting me speak and tell our story. And uh, I will see you guys around on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next, I'd like to introduce, we've got the author of the excellent Puppet and Containerization book, platform engineering lead at Autopilot, Scott Coulton. Good morning, people. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is how to use containers with configuration management. And a little bit about myself is I've been working with containers for around about almost two years. I've been working with Puppet for around about six years. Um, I'm actually in a Docker captains program, which means Docker actually authorizes what I say, um, which is a nice thing. I'm not just saying stuff that I don't know. And I have got battle scars of actually running this stuff in production, not only in the job I am in now, but in my past job. So I recently changed jobs about four weeks ago, and that's going to come up for some really interesting stories today. Um, because I was in a place that was a high security government agency, and now I'm in a startup. So I've seen both sides of the world, and it's actually a lot of similarities between the two, even though they think that there's not, there is a lot. Um, so why did I start looking at Docker to start off with? So when I was a solution architect, one of the fundamental pro problems that we had was that we ran CD in parallel. So application development was getting um, deployed with their own CD process, and infrastructure as a code was getting deployed with its own CD process. But they never met in the middle. They didn't know about each other. They were completely oblivious which made it really hard to tie up um, release models of infrastructure as a code with Puppet compared to what we were doing in the app space. What, and the other, one of the reasons it was set up this way is because infrastructure still did production releases. And that was tying us down. Um, and that made silos, made at the time that there were silos built up, which was, which was not really cool. So what the devs would do would be dump code into an artifact repository, and then they deploy it all the way up to stage, and then the infrastructure guys would deploy it to prod. But we weren't the SME on those applications. We weren't a Java developer at the time, and we were just hoping that we'd seen the bamboo logs that they were deployed correctly before the stage environment, that when we press the button, that it would work. Um, but the problem with that is we also become the bottleneck to deploy applications. So not only were we trying to keep the platform going for, for the application team, so whether it be with Puppet, with containerization, or, or cloud in general, um, so we were looking after all the AWS resources. We were looking after all the Puppet resources. We were also looking after all the container resources in the ecosystem, and we were also looking after deploying to prod. So you can imagine that we had five dev teams, one infra team, and quite quickly, we were very quickly becoming the bottleneck. And that put us under pressure with the business because we were meant to be agile. Um, one of the things that we did, and this is the mistake we made at the time, but we thought it would be really um, a good idea to do, was we puppetized absolutely everything we could. Like, we'd done crazy stuff. Like, 
to reverse engineer uh, a CA product, I actually ran git init on the root file system, installed it, seen the diff, and then put that into Puppet, just so we could automate stuff. We were doing crazy stuff, because we thought automating everything would make our lives easier. What we actually did is started to take over the application dev role, and we were looking after applications in Puppet that really should have been looked after by the application deployment. So again, now we're getting more tickets in coming in, and that was really, really painful because instead of increasing what we were doing with the platform, we were just keeping the lights on. And no dev team, because we were an infrastructure as code team, no dev team just wants to be keeping the lights on right. We've got really great ideas. We want to be able to make the platform better. Um, there's a lot of stuff we wanted us to do. We just didn't have the bandwidth. And the business was not going to throw just more, um, more bodies at the problem because it just wouldn't be economical to do so. Um, so what, what was the solution to that? Oh, I'll go, go through some of the challenges, sorry. So what, what the challenges for the business were, were there was high turnaround for requests. For someone that did CD, it could take two to three days for an application to be upgraded because the, that's just how many Jira tickets we had coming in. It wasn't a problem that it wasn't um, automated. We had all the, all the automation there. It's just that we as a team took on too, too much responsibility in the deployment process. And what we needed to do was improve the CD process so that we could work on our stuff but give application developers some more freedom. Um, this meant that there were slow deployments to production and what we had to do at the time there and where you should, what you should always be thinking with a, a solution is maintain some sort of compliance. Even if internally you don't have a security team, you should try to use best practices always. It, it will make your life a lot easier. And there's some really good white papers about how you should maintain compliance with both Puppet or Docker. So let's just not let the application developers deploy themselves. Um, so the business saw that there's an issue that we're being over-bombarded, but yet they wouldn't let the application developers deploy themselves. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place. This is where we really needed to get to a cultural shift um, and start to really break down the silos because we were an application team in development, so everything was in Puppet. We used Terraform to deploy to AWS, and we already were using containers at the time. So that was, um, sorry, I just grabbed some water. So that seemed logical. If, if the application developers wanted to upgrade a version of some underlying like, base that they use, like um, WSO2 or something like that, the infrastructure team wasn't the SME in it, but yet we were the ones doing the upgrade. The loop could come back then that it didn't work the way the application devs thought it did. Our Puppet module worked to upgrade it, and that ticket would spin around, and it would spin around, and it would spin around. So you have an infrastructure dev now working for a week, going back and forth with an application developer, when the application developer was the SME. Um, so we really needed to get to the point where we could offload this sort of upgrade process and this sort of testing process back to the application developers. So what we, what we wanted to do to allow this to happen was we took on all the best practices of software development lifecycle. So we took everything as code, as I mentioned earlier. We used Terraform, um, we used Golang, we used Puppet, everything. We had 100% um, node coverage with Puppet, and we started to pick up containerization because we found that if we started to use containerization and we found the, the, the downsides to it and the pain processes and what we wanted to do with it, um, by the time we gave that over as a platform um, to the developers, we would be able to know like, kind of what was going to go wrong and we would have eaten our own dog food and felt the heartache because the last thing you want to do is suggest to the application developers, you should do more and then the platform can't support what you're actually telling them to do. So we took it on board and took the hit of trying to really bring quality and best practices into our team so we could then um, show other teams like, what to do and what the pain processes, they've, pain processes that they've gone through. So one thing that we, we looked at is everything had to be automated from where to go. So we use, as I said, Terraform would bootstrap an AWS instance, Puppet would then talk to that, 
and everything would go through a build process, whether it be a Puppet module, we'd use RSpec Puppet. If it was with Docker, we'd do Docker file linting. Um, if it was Terraform, we'd use Terraform plan to make sure that um, things would not get pulled down and sport back up like the destroy process. What we, we, we started to see, as we started to become more heavily into the dev side, we started to break down barriers. So once we were starting to talk code, even though we were using something like Golang or we were talking in Terraform, once that we could give an application developer some code to read, even if it wasn't the language that they read, the silos started to come down, right? Because we're all talking the same language now. As long as there was comments through the code, and they can basically read it, like all of these new languages are pretty, pretty easy and pretty readable, you start to see the, 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 the silos start to break down. And then you, we, what we started to see was application developers wanted to look at Puppet code. So now they actually have got a vested interest. Now that everything's in source and now that it's easy for them to read, they started to look at what was happening in the infrastructure team. And this was probably the most like, important cultural change that happened. That now that we were looking at a solution, we weren't looking at infras doing this and apps doing this. We were looking at a solution end to end as a team. And as soon as we did that, by osmosis, things started to really pick up. We started to get efficiencies. We started to see, like, we had more appreciation for what the app devs were doing, and the app devs had more appreciation. It wasn't just like, oh, that's an infra problem anymore, which is really, really powerful. So now we had a little bit more, a little bit more like, time on our hands, and we were allowed to do like, this project to get this up. So we, I had this idea. We, we've, we've used Docker for eight months. The business has seen that we can, we can use it. There's no issues. We've felt all, the, felt all the pain. Now we had to get the new wave of infrastructure development out into the wider business. And this is where Puppet really, really, sh um, really shone. We wanted to automate the platform end to end with Puppet using, um, we tried both Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. We ended up going for Docker Swarm. And to set that up in a secure way was um, a, a non-trivial um, piece of work. So if you've got, say, 1,000 nodes and you want to set up Docker TLS, you want to set up the engine to like the CIS benchmark, which Docker has released, to make sure that the API's got the proper auth on it and everything else is hardened, that's a non-trivial piece of work. There's, I think, about 74 or 85, sorry, the new release, there's about 85 items that you have to do to the API to harden it to the CIS benchmark. So if you're going to do that across 1,000 nodes, that, that, that is a non-trivial piece of work. And being humans as we are, it won't be exactly the same way across 1,000 nodes. You'll have a percentage of nodes out there that won't act exactly the same way because we're humans, we could have missed a step. And this is where Puppet really grew with us. So one of the things that we, what I learned that Puppet can do um, that I didn't know beforehand is Puppet is really good at defining a resource behind an API. So think about that. That's a whole new way to think about what Puppet can do. So instead of defining a resource on a box, you can define a resource on a cluster behind an API. And Puppet allows you to do this by writing custom type and providers. So if you're using something like Docker on the other side that has a well-spec API, as long as you write your Ruby code to understand the responses, when Puppet runs, it's, it will look for the resource, but it will look for it on a cluster of nodes. So this actually blew my mind. This is a really, really cool way to use Puppet. And when we started to really get into the way this worked, we saw the power behind it. And this is where we come up to the bit where we looked at the, how we could use the API, but the REST API would then be also good for the developers to deploy to. Because instead of using Puppet to deploy the applications, we would build the container as a service platform with Puppet and then give a REST API to the developers. Because or most developers these days are fairly familiar with REST APIs. But what we would do is we would write some smart code to look at what, um, what containers are running in the cluster, um, get the API response back, and Puppet would make sure that they're defined there. And this is a really, really powerful way to start to use Puppet. And I think this will really be coming up in the next year or so. Um, I remember I was speaking at PuppetConf last year about Puppet and Docker and AWS. And I was in a little back room. And I think there was about 20 people there. Um, but now on YouTube, it's got over 1,000 hits. Because it was probably a bit bleeding edge last year. But this year, it seems to be a bit more. It's probably on the edge, but not bleeding edge. But there's a lot more people interested in doing containers at scale. 
Um, and there's some really cool stuff you can do. So why did we choose Docker? So there's a few different choices for container, containerization. So CoreOS has Rocket. Um, there's Docker, and there's a few other smaller ones. So we were starting to look at Docker before it was released 1.0. 1, 1 um, one of the things that was brilliant with Puppet was Gareth Rushgrove wrote this really cool module, and we could install Docker first time every time and just start playing with it. Um, at the time, there was no other configuration management tools to look after containerization, so it just felt like a really easy fit for us because what we wanted to do was actually develop a platform. We didn't really want to spend a lot of time writing a complex module that was already there from the forge. So thanks to like Gareth, we were able to pick that up really easily. We were able to install it, and we were starting, able to start deving, and that's what we really wanted to do. The other thing is, as we grew, um, the module and the community grew. Um, so as Docker networking came out in Docker 1.9, Gareth's module had Docker networking in it. Docker Compose came along, and you were able to use YAML as ERB files, as templating files to pass to the API. The module had that in it. And it it's really, really shows the strength of the Puppet community that this one particular module that's had over 100,000 downloads has so many pull requests against it. So many people are using it. So many people are passionate about it. It really pays tribute to what the Puppet community can do. So you, for something like Docker, you don't need to reinvent the wheel now. You can go to Puppet Forge at the moment, and there's modules for Kubernetes. There's modules for Docker. There's modules for Mesos. There's modules for Docker Swarm. People have already been out there and working on it. So instead of having to reinvent the wheel, you can just go to the Forge. You can find the module you need. And then if there's a feature that you want, put a pull request in. And you can help the community grow. Um, so there's been a lot of people working on like, kind of the bleeding edge stuff. And it, all this stuff's already in the Forge. So it's a really great time to really start using containerization um, with, with Puppet. And as I said, configuration management is your best friend. So when we started to get into doing some really crazy stuff with containers, um, this is not only at my past job, but at the job I am now, um, configuration management to deploy. So if you want to deploy Kubernetes at scale or Docker Swarm at scale securely with auth setup, with TLS, with um, something handling these secrets like Vault, you want that end-to-end -end automated, I, it will take you a long time to do that at scale repeatedly by Bash or repeatedly by someone logging in and doing it. The good thing is Puppet will, will allow you to do this at scale, and not only allow you to do it at scale, it understand, you can write a type and provider that understand, understands the scheduler that you're using. So as, that's when I talk about the API, if you choose Kubernetes, you can write, and Gareth Rushgrove has also written this, um, Puppet code that understands the Kubernetes API. It understands what's happening behind there, and it can deploy to the Kubernetes API. We use Docker Swarm. We have a type and provider that, that knows what Docker Swarm's doing. It gives, back, it gives us back a response code and knows if a container is healthy, and knows if the service is running the right amount of containers, and it also allows us to auto heal if a node has failed and Puppet has seen that one of the, the containers in a service is not running, Puppet will actually send an API call to update the service to make sure it is running. So the good thing about that is Docker Swarm has orchestration built in for services, and, and Puppet has configuration management for um, Docker Swarm. But what we don't do is override the two things. We harmoniously put them together through um, REST APIs. And again, I'll, I'll harp on this. Um, I know Alassian is starting to do some work on this. Um, and there's a few other people. I really think it's the way that infrastructure is going to go. Um, it's definitely, like, especially in the container world, everything's run on REST APIs. And being able to use Puppet with REST APIs is, is, is a match made in heaven. It's a little bit of work to get it going up front. But that's kind of the power of Puppet, right? It allowed me to be able to develop this, this technique with REST APIs because it, they gave me the interface for type and providers. And once you start to think like that and you start to really get into how you're going to automate with Puppet in the new school of thinking, um, you'll find that now your infrastructure team has really become a dev team. So we're looking at now doing API calls. We're getting response codes from APIs. Um, that doesn't sound like your traditional infrastructure team anymore. Um, we actually, and I heard Kelsey Hightower say this yesterday, what would you do differently if you didn't have SSH access to your boxes? With Puppet and Docker, why would you need SSH access to your boxes anymore? If you go through proper testing, 
if you go through the rigor of what you need to do to get code onto the boxes, um, you should be able to develop locally in Vagrant. You should be able to check your puppet code. You should have already done tests on your Docker containers and your schedulers. And by the time you push that into your CD pipeline, you shouldn't be SSHing into boxes anymore. Configuration management should be just doing its job. And if you put quality code into your CD pipeline, you'll get quality back. So once you really get through the mindset that, hey, let's, let's, let's do this. And we, I sat down with my team and said this. Let's do this. Let's not SSH in the boxes anymore. We're, we're better than that. We're, we've got good development practices. We've got good testing frameworks thanks to Puppet, like using Puppet RSpec and, and things like that. Let's, let's see if we can do this. And when we challenged ourselves, we didn't take SSH access off ourselves, but we didn't use it. And we, we found that we did a lot better work. We the, you had so, so much skin in the game. You didn't want to be the guy that made a puppet change that sl the Slack channel said, hey, this puppet runs failed. Because you didn't want to be the guy on the team that did that, that didn't do the development processes properly. And by osmosis, then we got a really, really high quality turnaround on all our puppet code. Um, so this is why I've, I've heard at meetups people have asked me, I, I'm going to use Docker. I'm not going to use Puppet anymore. And I was like, OK. It's like kind of two different levels of, of thinking. Why would you do that? And they're like, oh, my state's defined in the container. I said, it is, that's true. But how are you going to get the container to the host? How are you going to set up your Docker API? How are you going to set up your schedulers? The, the, it's not, I, I don't think there's a, the, the conversation should be about, should we use Docker or Puppet? It should be, how do we use them together? How do we use configuration management to configure our schedulers, make sure they're secure, make sure it's in a defined state? Because that's what we want to do. We don't want to use one or the other. And I really think that's where configuration management becomes your best friend. Um, I remember we had a dev meeting at, at my, my job now, and I, they had no Puppet code before I started four weeks ago. And I explained to them, they say, we're using Docker. Where does Puppet fit in? And I said, Docker does build, ship, run. And I said, Puppet's the ship. They build the ship so we can, we can ship the application code. And when they, when they got that, uh, they were like, yeah, that's really cool. So what's next? So what, we, what, what I'm doing now in my new position is mature app development team is already there. And I've actually integrated the platform team into dev teams. So we are the one team. We're not two separate teams. Um, so that, by osmosis, allows pull requests. So I have app devs doing pull requests on infrastructure stuff. And I have put in pull requests on Node.js stuff. So now through osmosis, you've got an infra guy doing app pull requests, and I've got pull requests coming back the other way. Now, what business doesn't want that? That's efficiency right there. If you've got two different people with two different focuses, but can do pull requests on each other's code um, to help each other out to get a stable solution end to end, that is awesome. The other thing that we're starting to do internally is be really, really um, consistently setting up strong practices around the way that our code should be when we accept a pull request. So we've looked at um, open source projects like Puppet and Docker, and we're taking that in-house into our GitHub projects. So we have standards that, that, that the pull requests have to go by. We have um, automated testing that says, hey, you have or have not um, done the right thing for this pull request to even be looked at yet. Um, so that's what we're, we're doing next. And I think that will take us into the next phase of our infrastructure. But again, I really, really think that um, check out the stuff with REST APIs and Puppet. I, I really do think that's where the future is going. And that's me. Thank you for having me. And have a good trip. Have a good conference. My job today is to announce the most valuable puppeteer. This is a person who's voted on by, by you, by the community. I wasn't even asked. Uh, <laughs> I might have been willing, able to submit if I had not told them who I was. I don't know. Um, but the most valuable puppeteer is for someone who's gone above and beyond in their participation in the community, done more for the community and in the community than any other individual. And the winner is chosen by an open vote in the community. I'd like all of you to join me in congratulating Rob Nelson as this year's Most Valuable Puppeteer.
Rob is always answering questions in Slack. His GitHub profile is alive with contributions in Puppet and all around the Puppet ecosystem. And he does loads of work for the Vox Pupili group. <laughs> thank you for all you do for the Puppet community, Rob. And thank you for all the effort you put in and all the people you've helped. Thank you. That's it. Community is amazing. Keep encouraging that community. The support and the feedback which you get and just the feel that the puppet company listens to the community and takes on board ideas and helps adapt and grow as well is really encouraging. It makes you want to contribute more, so good job. If puppet doesn't do something that you need it to do today, nothing's stopping you from proposing that pull request, asking for that feature change. I moved from this really tiny town in Brazil to New York City. And the reason for that it was because someone found me on GitHub and know my work with Puppet at the time and they hired me because of that. The Puppet community is incredible. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today as a project, as a company, as a movement without the Puppet community. I'm so excited to see what we do next together. I, I can't wait for that.